Um, All right, so we had a quick little restart here, so we'll just reboot with that last little bit. Okay. Um, today, what we're really talking about, guys, is we have the Center for Social Innovation. You see some cool writing behind us. That's all the organizations that are here at the center. Uh, we're going to be talking with Eli and Dave, the sort of founding team. Uh, the executive director is Eli, and we're, they're going to tell our story of what social impact means for New York City and how how an organization can start to actually support that. Uh, we'll be doing it various different ways. Uh, the great thing about our technology is that it's live uh, and it's on the fly and it's informal. The other part of it is we're probably going to bring some chairs in so we'll get a little further away from you and start shooting that way today. Uh, I'm working on some other cameras, but um, it doesn't always work out the way you want. <laughs> and you just go with it. Uh, and that's totally cool. So, Monica, we were talking about the mayor. There's a new mayor that's been elected, the Blasio. How is he different than Bloomberg? Big. Oh my God, so different. Wow. I mean, but how? Uh, well, I'll tell you a couple things. Uh, one is that uh, he's, quote, for the people, of the people, by the people, uh, which Bloomberg is actually um, called the King Mayor, you know, that was a uh, belief that he was only for the city's elite and wealthy. I, I don't know if you're not seen different things from him, but um, he's definitely had a different approach. De Blasio has more of a um, social services kind of, uh, I would say, pretty straightforward democratic philosophy of how the government can help people, give them a leg up. And um, Bloomberg was much more on the entrepreneur side, like figure it out yourself. I made myself a self-made man he is, uh, and a billionaire. So you guys figure it out, we'll just help you do that. So there's huge differences. Yeah. But um, both of them are progressive. But I, I don't know what de Blasio is going to do. One of the things that you noted was that de Blasio is very much into um, boroughs. Uh, Manhattan has gotten a lot of life coming from Mayor Bloomberg over the past few years. And that's where I'm from, um, Upper West Side. And Shane is from Harlem. And Harlem is like having a completely great rebirth. But Brooklyn, of course, is you know off the charts great. Everybody knows about that. The Bronx, you might not know, is doing great, and um, it's because there's got such innovators over there and such uh, incredibly interesting um, uh, programs and out of the academic institutions, Fordham being one of them, and City University, another one. Um, so I don't know what the mayor's going to do, but in Queens and Staten Island, uh, there's definitely startups happening and entrepreneurship happening, but I, I think that's one of the things that Palazzo is going to change is kind of bringing in um, more collaboration through the boroughs. And by the way, uh, we will, Shane and I, and several other really interesting entrepreneurs on Fordham University will be presenting a conference January 16th in New York. We'll do it, we'll be sharing it live as well. We'll be a little better quality than this because I think we'll really be helping this. Um, and it will be January 16th at the Graduate Business School in Manhattan, and it's really amazing. It's called Make Impact NYC. And we haven't publicly announced it yet. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, we're going to be announcing it next week with a bunch of really cool entrepreneurs and great keynote speakers from all of New York. It's, it's about five girls, one city, endless impact. So, Shane, you want to come chat with us? Yeah, I think what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to have two camera angles here. Um, the camera is not working. No, we actually have our live stream. Those of you guys who want to watch us on live stream, we're there for you, uh, and we'll be through this show. Uh, there's Monica. But we're going to we're going to at the at the point where our guests come in is we're going to spend a little time uh, chatting with them on uh, in the big screen. So we got two cameras running right now: our live stream one and our Google Hangout. Uh, and that will get us sort of off to the races here. Um, one of the things that I was looking at when I was looking at the transition team for de Blasio is he seems to be focused on minority issues and the issues of people, the underclass, much more so than the upper class, which is what Bloomberg was, has been about for 12 years, uh, and Giuliani before him. You know? Giuliani before him was basically the same kind of person. I think Bloomberg's been more egalitarian than Giuliani. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. More in what way? Because he stopped some uh, race riots, I remember, early on in the city. He could just jump right in and he said, um, you know, we can't do this. And he investigated where Giuliani was always, you know, just like the police did something, they were right, and never even investigated. I mean, that's his whole thing. He blows a cop, you know, that was like his mentality. I think Bloomberg's been more fair. There's been things that have come up that he's. Plus, I know a person that um, 
had gotten his apartment in the days of uh, rent stabilization, and they were trying to cut out all those things. Yeah. Uh, Mitch Lama, and he had a, an apartment down on the West Village, and his two bedroom apartment was going to be reverted back to market price. And Bloomberg came in and helped everybody that was in the building. They were all actors, directors, and performers who had been there for 20 years by insider price. So he got a two bedroom apartment on Washington Street for $150,000 about seven years ago wow. before the crash. So, uh, so here's a question for me, and this this relates to the mayor, I think, and the, to the transition team. If the median price for buying a place in New York City now is probably seven hundred thousand dollars, yeah, who can afford that? That actually works regular jobs, that isn't on Wall Street or isn't uh, doesn't have some six figure, two six figure incomes in their house. Yeah, two six figure, maybe three or four. But I think really, I mean, totally. let's talk pragmatically. Yeah. You know, what does that What does that mean? I, I honestly, it never <laughs> makes sense to me. Like I look at the numbers and I you know, look at places to buy, but then you do the numbers and you're like, you can afford this. Yeah. I was in real estate for a long time, and I understand that. But I, I think that's where De Blasio will come in. One of the big things he's going to do is kind of create initiatives for affordable housing. Nothing like that happened under the New York. In fact, they were repealing a lot of the affordable housing laws. So this is true. And I think he's really pushing for middle classes and lower income classes you know, to get a leg up and sort of create some sort of affirmative action citywide around that. And that's a great thing because we, we need it. Yeah. We really need it. I think it should be a balance of like how to support the city um, in terms of sustainability, um, which is something I love about uh, Bloomberg, just to go side note, eco-sustainability. But I think in terms of economic sustainability, how do we balance it? That's what we're trying to say as social entrepreneurs. How do we balance doing something good and really making things just and fair, and at the same time making money and being able to make a living? I think it's absurd that things, you know, a regular apartment was $700,000. I mean, that's not a mayor's responsibility. Their responsibility is to create sort of structures that are given incentives to real estate developers to uh, create affordable housing. And that's what right. Mitchell Long is all about. Right. I, I mean, you look at, quote, the market, right? And we let the market dictate what happens in various parts of the city. Um, I don't know. I find it really challenging to even conceive of the fact that at this moment, we really do have sort of two different universes left. Yeah, uh, I the people who live way in the outer outer boroughs, or who might be able to have been lucky enough to have bought into their apartments during the time they were cheap enough. Mm -hmm. But now taxes are higher too. Uh, so one of my questions is, if you're going to be borough focused, how do we move the energy of the borough? And Timothy, you had a great question on Twitter. Uh, you sent this to me yesterday. Uh, you had a great question about to the mayors. If in fact De Blasio is, is borough focused. How do you get the disenfranchised boroughs like Staten Island and the Bronx engaged back into the city? Well, I think first thing is we have our conference on January 16th, and we're going to do exactly that. We're going to bring all of the boroughs in New York together in one place at Fordham University or Lincoln Center, and we're going to create uh, a dynamic of community for social good in New York to kind of address certain social issues and problems that we have. So I think that's a start, but I think. The mayors have a lot of, um, they have a tremendous amount of support and power behind them, as we know from Bloomberg, to stimulate different programs and different initiatives, uh, outreach in the city, bring these places in. Because Queens is doing, um, there are parts of Queens, there are parts of Brooklyn, Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan that are really struggling and suffering. Really, like certain groups of people don't have health care. They don't have a place to live. They don't have food. I mean, it's crazy that in New York we should have such inequity. That's my view. Um, <laughs> so I just made a note. I just made a motion to our guests. Uh, I think they're coming in here in just a second. <laughs> we're uh, we have a little, uh, we're up to a little bit of technical um, rocky road this morning, but we definitely got everything or this afternoon now. Uh, and but we have everything going. I guess I'm still in California time. And I'm, I'm waving our uh, guests in, so what we're going to do is we're going to back up, all right? So let's back up the make room okay. for all these guys to okay. see. I'm going to do a couple of uh, camera adjustments. All right, so we're a line of four. A line of four. That's easy. 
life. Are you guys going? I have four here. I heard them get them all in. Where do you want to return? On the four chairs that are playing right in front of you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No one separate their chairs. Do not move your chair. As, uh, as, I don't know if you've ever been to Late Night with David Letterman or any of those guys, but those sets were huge, right? They look absolutely massive, and they're not. They're like microscopic. The desk is the size of your laptop, and then literally they have enough space um, for everyone to sit like right next to each other. Why? Because it always looks good on camera. For some reason, cameras make us really wide and apart from each other, which is very sad. It's not even we should be together, right, Eli? <laughs> All right, so we got it. Now we've got it together. Cool. So we've got our camera set up here. Um, and one of the things I wanted to push to you guys today, really to have a conversation with you. Hey! <laughs> uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Gene Snipes, as you probably know. This is Monica, and you're watching That Matters. And we've got our guest today. Uh, it's always nice that Gabe guys is here, and Eli like, once gets here as well. Uh, Eli and Dave helped bring this organization, actually where we're sitting right now shooting weekly, the Center for Social Innovation uh, in New York City to the area. So I guess for us today, it's sort of to start with where where did the idea come from? Let's, let's start with the seed of the idea at the very initial part. Because you guys have checked the Center for Social Innovation out a little bit. I know that. We want you to say, oh yeah, social innovation. But where did the idea of social innovation come from? Uh, so I guess there's two seeds. Uh, one seed is the seed behind the original idea back in 2004, and the second seed uh, is represented by the guys who have the idea with the seed. So um, the original seed was back in 2004, 2003, looking around at a nonprofit sector that was changing quite dramatically. Uh, emergence of a new field called social entrepreneurship uh, that wasn't really well understood. And what we were noticing was that most organizations were really under-resourced, and that's still true today. And one of the implications of being under-resourced is that they were in isolation from each other in substandard facilities. And looking around at this incredibly meaningful and powerful movement that is so disaggregated that it had inefficiencies in duplication. And the idea was, could we create a space, could we create a place where organizations and individuals would come together we could leverage the economies of scale to get access to better evidence and facilities that we could afford at home. We could create the condition for collaboration across sectors and silos that typically didn't have a chance to speak to each other. And we could unleash the potential of creative energy, the entrepreneurial energy of this movement around social enterprise and social innovation. And what began as a 5,000 uh, square foot experiment in 2004 in Toronto with about 14 tenants really just took flight. And the next seven years, uh, before Dave Bikes entered the picture, was one of experimentation, development, refinement, and incredible growth, where what was uh, a 5,000 square foot space in time became 70,000 square feet across three sites, supported with 530 social change organizations in Toronto. Well, before we get into like, um, why that exploded, um, and by the way, Dave Bikes is Director of Operations here in New York, the Center for Social Innovation, and Glenn is the Executive Director, and they are. Um, and across the way, we have Ron Kingston, who is um, one of the executives here, community animators in the Center for Social Innovation. We're not in camera, but okay. say hi. And Ron Davidson, who could be, and Mark Castro. Hey, guys. <laughs> Some of our production helpers. Um, so, we want to just um, talk about what, you know, how did you know in 2004? That was like way. One second, we got one seat. I'm going to finish that off. The right. second seat is uh, up here. And that second seed emerged how? Um, Don't tell the story before. <laughs> it all started in 1969. <laughs> my, um, my best friend bought this building in 2011, which um, is a big building, it's the 10th largest building in Manhattan. Um, and he expressed interest in doing something to bring together the 6,000 tenants uh, in the building um, and help perform a community. And they asked me if I'd be willing to take space in the building to help do that. Um, so I actually wrote a blog post about CSI in Toronto uh, in 2009, 
and near that is a good place to start um, to get some tools to have to put together. Um, basically, I went there, I met with Eli, and in two seconds I knew that they were alive, they were to New York City. Um, and touring, touring their space, I uh, was just blown away by the vibe, by the and I had studied programming space in other parts of the world, and I was just blown away by what I felt when I walked into their space. So um, I asked Eli to take him to New York, and the famous line is, uh, no. he said, absolutely not. <laughs> and we're very happy, and we're you know, really trying to uh, deepen our practice here in Toronto. And as a New Yorker, an entrepreneur, and a little bit of a hustler, I said I wasn't going to take that for an answer. Um, so I came back here, and I started emailing them links to my friend's building, and to, to the company, and basically told them that uh, I think it was an opportunity that they should really look into a little bit further. And a week later, we got an email that, that they should be willing to come down and talk about it. And then Tanya, uh, you know, we had a kind of magical first meeting with my friend's company, Mark Sword Realty, uh, and that started the discussion. And I would say probably nine months from there. From that point, it was from that was like last year, though. Yeah. You talked about it in 2009 for the blog. What attracted you to CSI Magic Fund? So I, was, uh, I had a venture called Open Office Space, and I was studying the working models. Um, and uh, I was very intrigued by why there were no four open spaces in Long Island, where I was focused. Um, and I just basically said that uh, the title of the blog was Why Are There No Four Open Spaces in Long Island, inspired by this type of social innovation. Um, and uh, just doing research, I found that they wrote books on how do you create these short spaces and how do you create communities. So uh, just piqued my interest, and they seemed like they figured it out, and they did. Well, one thing I'm going to say about that, and this is like something I find really intriguing, is that Toronto beat New York, like Cole and Demo, by years in this space. So talk a little bit about that. And like, what, I mean, I've been in New York like, for years, and you know there's a different cultural that eats up us here in some ways. Well, what's similar, what's different? Why did it start there and not here? I cannot wait with an answer to this question. <laughs> 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 You know, I, I, I think it's like any, I mean, the truthfully, I think it's like any idea. There's there's some magic and serendipity and circumstance that just brings together the people at the right time and the right opportunity. I don't think it's necessarily a function that Toronto is further ahead or smarter people in Toronto or necessarily a great opportunity. I just think that there was just a particular constellation of factors in Toronto. Um, New York real estate is even more prohibitive than it is. Um, in, in, in Toronto, there is thriving social entrepreneurial energy, but uh, it's very fragmented, and perhaps because the sector is in fact so large that there aren't as many people who are thinking about the sector under like a single narrative and are thinking about it as a, a single entity. And so instead, they're looking at different slices of it. And perhaps that's one factor where that bird's eye view of how do we support New York's social entrepreneur sector might just not have been as easily kind of captured as it was in Toronto. Uh, what's interesting also in New York is when I first visited New York yeah, in a professional capacity, it was probably 2007, and there were maybe five or six co working spaces. When I came back in 2012, there were probably about 70 or 80. And so the co working movement really took off in New York, but it was mostly focused on tech design, uh, entrepreneurs in general. There was nothing focused on social change. And I really think it was just. You know, there wasn't the right real estate opportunity, there wasn't the right person position to look at it from a bird's eye point of view. Co-working was so associated with traditional business that I think the dots just weren't connected in that way. And I think that there have been a couple of efforts, but they just haven't quite gotten traction. And in the meanwhile, what we have been doing was really refining the model, building it incrementally and growing, and that position has to be able to come in and create something of value for, for the city. And, and we are honored and thrilled to have a chance to be in New York to be able to bring this model to this great city and to invite the city to help us shape what, what we're trying to accomplish together. Um, Just a question from yeah. our perspective. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you talk about social entrepreneurship and social innovation and social enterprise and all those pieces, what was it in Canada that allowed it to sort of emerge as a field that could be supported? You know, for a long time, nonprofits have sort of existed in that space. Was there a turning point? Now, where the opportunity showed up? Um, 
there wasn't a turning point. There was a turning uh, incline or arc, maybe over over roughly a five year period. Uh, I think in some respects we had something to do with that because the uh, I was not a co-founder of the Center for Social Innovation. I was brought on at the University of Operations. And really I think there were some questions there in calling it the Center for Social Innovation because the term now is just starting to get some recognition and some currency in terms of um, mainstream uh, awareness and, and I'm sure most of us would agree we're still talking in like one or two percent of mainstream awareness. Um, so at the time, it was incredibly prescient for these founders to say, we're going to call it social innovation as something important. And it doesn't belong just to the nonprofit sector. It doesn't belong, uh, it belongs also to the corporate sector, to the public sector, to entrepreneurs and individuals that are committed to find new ways to create a difference in, in, in all sorts of social, cultural, and environmental issues. And so um, it wasn't as if the ground was necessarily fertile. We had to fight a pill. People wouldn't answer our doors. The uh, public sector, the city government would not respond to anything. Uh, and I think it was by dint of our effort in part, our focus and our commitment that started to build some familiarity with the terms and the practices of social relations, and social entrepreneurship. And we were supported by an amazing cast of uh, you know, characters and, and I mean, uh, in no way to, uh, in some ways it became a focal point for the community energy, but there's some incredible organizations in Toronto Enterprise Fund and funding nonprofit social enterprises, um, uh, policy makers, there, there was really uh, energy that was happening in the city, but what the Center for Social Innovation wanted to do is help create an era around it, sort of bring people around, and, and then we've got just an incredible array of groups and, and um, and we see the same thing happening here in New York City, of course, where it's still in a somewhat emergent phase, uh, but a lot of activity, a lot of enthusiasm, and I've got a lot of hope in the world. I think there's a lot of promise in the city for years ahead. Definitely. And David, I just want to ask you, uh, how, who, can you tell us a little bit about the real estate company and the mystery man behind it? Because how did you convince them, or did you need to convince them? Did you jump on all the social innovation and public space? I mean, you had to make a lot of sacrifices. This is one of the most expensive buildings in the world. Uh, I mean, initially, he, if the idea came from him, not, not necessarily around social innovation, um, about creating incubators to bring together the community, um, they were using the term incubator, and, and I kind of pointed out right away that they could probably do what he was going to do in terms of bringing together the community. Um, as soon as I came back from Toronto and started sharing with them um, a bit about the model, and certainly after they met uh, with Ivan Klein, because we met with their whole organization. I mean, you know, it was a very interesting and magical first meeting where he's a very interesting and passionate guy doing some really cool things in the city. Uh, and he spoke for about 45 minutes and they spoke for about 45 minutes and I would say it was like watching the uh, Flash of the Titans where you know, just so impressed yeah. and it was just such a, um, a natural. I mean, was, I think after that first meeting it, it was definitely going to happen. It didn't need a lot of pushing up though. And what's his name of the company? Uh, Scott Reckler and the company is RX Real Realty. Okay, we keep referring to Tonya. So tell yeah. us a little bit about Tonya and her own name and how she came up with the idea. Great, yeah. So uh, I wanted to mention that. So Tonya is fun to serve. Tonya is our CEO, one of my co founders of the Center for Social Innovation and, and certainly one of the driving forces um, behind its uh, initial development and, and a driving force through its uh, growth over these past uh, almost few years. Tonya has uh, an incredible history as, uh, as an activist, a community developer, working in inventing government structures, working in the intersection of nonprofits and technology, uh, all around civil society, civil participation. And she was one of five people who were beginning to talk about this notion of a shared space for social entrepreneurs and social innovators. Uh, another key character in, in the um, development of the model was only Mark Zyber, who um, in many ways parallels the experience of the Italian Scott Reckler and RX Realty. In so far, she was a landlord who had owned a couple of buildings. She had a real strong orientation towards parks and nonprofit organizations, and at a certain point said, let's stop talking about it, let's go for it, I will provide this space, and provided uh, rent reductions and investments in capital, and said, let me help support it and get it off the ground. Uh, Tony stepped forward at that point and said, I'll volunteer to be the executive director. We try to build this up and see if we can create a, a sustainable enterprise out of it. And, and uh, you know, that was just the rocket ship that that took off. And, and Tony's been our, our, our fearless uh, leader for the last few years. Great visionary, really tapped into um, trends and uh, 
changing patterns in our sector and in the world. And really, the, the team has grown and evolved, and been compassionate as part of this team. It, it is really incredible. So it's not just a special place to work uh, for members, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but it's a special place to work as a staff team. There's a lot of commitment and passion on this team. Yeah, um, I want to throw in a question that I probably get tons of questions, which I really appreciate, guys. Uh, you did read those questions on Facebook, Twitter, and all those other venues, so continue to do that because that way I can ask really super casual questions, and this is something I can tell you on my mouth, and I can blame on you guys. But Tanya uh, is a woman that I know in Texas that you were just doing her own things, and it was a similar name. She, uh, she actually had the question of, why isn't every business focused on good? And how is your co-workspace, like she sees happening in Houston where she's at, how is co-workspace different in a place like this than it is in other places? Um, and on the latter question, do you mean how is it different in, in the space in terms of the social sector or in terms of geographically in New York? Um, I think in terms of like how companies operate here, is there a different ethos, is there a different feeling? Uh, and I think she's looking for some comparison between a cohort non social impact, but this versus a cohort on pure business focus. Sure, and I'll I'll like to take the chair's observation that's even in the last work uh, in a cohort in the field for the last couple of years. Um, so first, why is every business a social business? Uh, that's a question that we that maybe ask ourselves from time to time as well. I, I really think that you know, historically, we've, we've had this poll where on, on one side of the poll is corporations and on the other is charities. And charities are exclusively money dependent, trying to create good in the world. On the other poll, we have corporations that are exclusively concerned with maximizing revenue. And I think that that polarity, while it seems like it's been around forever, actually, ha actually hasn't been. And increasingly, um, what we've seen in the last 20 years, in the last five years especially, is this hybridization, this merging of practices where corporations are starting to realize that they can have and build in a social purpose, that the um, nonprofit organizations can be active in the market. So this is a very exciting space to be. And I would say to Tanya, uh, be patient is one. Uh, there's a lot of changes that are happening now, and I think the future is very promising. Uh, and I have as much confidence in the corporate sector and its ability to do and create change as I do in the nonprofit or traditional social change sector. Um, and the other is uh, people choose their interests and people follow their passions. And as much as I would wish that everybody was passionate about social change, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, I think what we've seen is generational change, we've seen an attitudinal shift. I mean, in any given year, 40 people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who have said, I've been doing this for this many years, I'm looking for meaning. And so I see a lot of signals that the world's uh, changing for the better. Um, but it's a slow process. This is uh, the start of it, of the time shift. Um, on the question of co working spaces, uh, I think that there is and uh, some symmetry between somebody who decides, I want to devote my life to creating social change. I think you can say that those types of people are also inclined towards meeting and talking and engaging with other people. There's less of a proprietary sense, there's less of a control sense, there's more of an interest in being part of the community. And I will say the Center for Social Innovation is excellent at running a uh, physical uh, space, a uh, facility, but where we're really good at building community, and that's our priority, is how we build a culture. And there are many co-working spaces where I think the factor is maybe less about the folks in the co spaces than it is about the principles and the people behind it and how they agree that keep those things in the space. There are many true extraordinary co-working spaces that build community in extraordinary ways that have nothing to do with social change. But as this new invention becomes kind of a fad and a new thing, the manifestations are quite diverse. Some of them are just places for people to work. And that is a fine proposition, a fine business model, but they can they can be so much more. And I think what we're doing is emblematic of, of, of not just the social change sector, but a type of co-working ethos that is really built around the community. Yeah, I was just saying um, that I feel, I feel the collaboration of the community and some of the things you guys are doing in terms of those shared conversations, the salad club, just the whole ethos here is that we all share the same goals and we need a better world. And it is like a big family. So Dave Chapman, as a New Yorker, um, and I love Dave's always playing, making jokes, and very uh, <laughs> 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 
Um, and Eli referred to him as his father's husband, so I'm just going to share that. I thought that was very nice. <laughs> that was good to be um, So tell me, like, how did you convince Eli to do this? Were you nervous? I mean, this is a big risk in New York, and I do find it moving, and I don't think this place is moving. So what, what's happened since you started in it? Yeah, I mean, I think we um, initially you know, we met with a whole bunch of people. Uh, Eli was visiting every other basically two weeks, right? And then um, initially it was just to gauge the interest. And I think very quickly we realized that there was a need for this New York City. Uh, and as the momentum started building with people who were meeting, um, it really, again, it wasn't hard to convince Eli to, to jump on. Because he was feeling, as I was feeling, we were taking meetings together while we were doing them alone. And you were coming out of the meetings and people were thanking us for bringing it to New York, or for the possibility of bringing it to New York. And you can see the difference in um, how the meetings went once we started construction. And so initially we were meeting in our offices, and there was a little bit of a, a lukewarm. They were excited, but you know they weren't over the top excited. And then we would meet them downstairs here. And then we would start meeting them in the construction side, and people saw that we were serious. And it was uh, a lot of people we met early on would come back to us and say, "Hey, yeah, this is really happening, and they want to jump in." So it was, uh, you know, I think we both Eli and I lived that. It was, you know, we saw it build right away, and um, it was just. I just want you to remember. I saw it like this. I saw it. So that was that was after they cleaned the space out. Yes. Before that, it was uh, a lot of the walls up. It was cubicles, and it was uh, yeah. That's a pretty amazing product. I saw it happily right in front of us. But you know, can we talk about some of the people? Some of the um, maybe we have a list of the names of organizations here, right? Do you want to um, maybe? Uh, Start with some of the people that are here, both of you. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll just um, uh, we I'll just very quickly we opened that um, pop up space right after Hurricane Sandy, uh, and it gave us an opportunity to um, offer free space to nonprofits, social entrepreneurs, and displaced by the hurricane. So we had some members uh, that are still members of our community start to work with us. So members like the way we see the world, that are product designers, that are working doing some amazing uh, work, sustainable design. Um, uh, 100 cameras, uh, doing amazing work. They go into marginalized communities and teach the children how to shoot. Um, they sell the photography and 100% of the persons go back to the city. So they're shooting them, shooting them. Shooting photography. Uh, <laughs> children uh, shooting <laughs> um, Yeah, and I, we've just signed our 150th lease. It's like 150 representations. Um, Amazing the caliber of the people that come into the space. Eli, you have some people that you think of here. I mean, I'll think of the social change that you're working with right now, who we had on the show last week. Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to find, you know, I'm always conscious of affecting a parent who are one of the children of the others. What's been amazing for us has been the breadth of organizations that have come here. And so we have organizations that uh, have been around for you know, 30 plus years. We have other organizations that incorporated last week are still haven't incorporated. We have nonprofits, we have for profits, we have community-based organizations. We have organizations based in parks, health, environment, education, social justice, civic issues. Um, the, the breadth of the diversity is really what makes the place sing. And our philosophy is that the sector has all the resources and assets it needs to really accomplish its goal. Its goals. Too often we have this kind of very resource poor, the scarcity mind frame. For social change organizations, we don't have the talent we need, we don't have the capital we need, we don't have access to the other resources we need, and, and really they're all around us. So what's missing is the kind of tissue. What's missing is the opportunity to build bridges across organizations. There are tons of people in New York City that are looking to donate. There are tons of people in New York City that want to volunteer their time or mentor. There are, you know, there is just so so many assets. And what we're trying to prove is that if we're a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more creative, a little bit more open to new ways of configuring our sector, we can be more efficient, more effective, and more systematic in the changes that we're trying to accomplish. So I'd like to think of CSI, the Center for Social Innovation, as a microcosm. And what we're trying to do is model the type of sharing, the information, the referrals, the support, the encouragement that can manifest at a larger level, at a city level, at a global level, um, and, and really prove that in being smarter about how we operate, we can create more change. Uh, and, and by working together, we can further faster.
So to so dive off into more of a, a personal perspective, what's your sort of personal take and why you this work for you, Kate? Um, I, mean, I feel very fortunate that I have, yeah. you know, being coming to work every day and meeting all the great organizations and people, uh, I just feel very fortunate that I have a friend with real estate who, you know, was buying and bought a building at a time where he wanted to, to do something different than the typical buildings where they just manage. That I knew of this model in Toronto that I was able to go there and they were to find where the world was the chance. Um, so I do it because I, I love being kind of the center of the universe, the people that are uh, doing amazing things, and to know that every day what we do supports their work and, and you know, the connections that we're helping them make uh, potentially lead to them accelerating their work. I mean, I plan and I want to go in the rest of my life. Um, I guess I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, the first was, I, I used to work in marketing. I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had done some traveling. And when I traveled, I, uh, the disparity that exists in the world was really brought to sharp relief for me. And the truth is, uh, sort of however this comes across, but I was uh, very successful at the things that were in front of me, schools, jobs. I always succeeded and did really well. But I wasn't passionate about anything in particular. And, and it was almost just like this conscious decision of, I've had such a good fortune. I've been given more than you know the top 1% in terms of you know family being born in a place with freedoms and food on my table, all these things. And things that so much more was so desperate for and for all of our history. That I truly felt a kind of moral, spiritual obligation to give back and to contribute, uh, contribute my life towards this cause. And the, the notion that I could actually be part of this, that I could be part of this narrative around making the world a better place, to me, there would be no greater satisfaction. Where I struggled a little bit was trying to figure out where to devote my energy. Uh, I like, I don't say I, I like puppies, but I didn't want to devote my life to them. Uh, I think the environment's a great thing, but I didn't want to, and it wasn't a thing I was so passionate about. So I didn't have a particular passion. I really was admired people that knew exactly what they wanted to do. And so I thought, maybe if I could just try to apply my talents to get into capacity building. Let me help others who are really passionate about what they want to do go for Because maybe that's a bit that I can create to add my expertise. And over the kind of five or six years in the nonprofit sector, I began to discover that that in itself was a passion and to be at the center for social innovation that exists primarily to help others achieve their goals with greater effectiveness and impact. It was really just this kind of magical confluence of, of opportunity. And I too have found where uh, I want to where I want to be. Uh, and one of the strengths of the center for social innovation is um, that we're a dynamic organization. This field is fast evolving, and we're keen to avoid ossification or institutionalization. We need to evolve, uh, and, and successful organizations in this day and age need to evolve and move around them. And so, to be part of an organization that's been able to sustain and evolve, uh, evolve and lead and be led by a changing sector is, is really just been such a treat and such a moment. And just to add, the first time that I met Eli, he said that he's in a place where his skill sets and passions align. I don't remember. That was our first meeting, and I feel it's the exact same way. And that was, uh, was in, um, but yeah, I mean, and I just I can attest now that I've been doing this since you know for like 18 months. It's exactly the same thing for me. So I feel like my passions and skill sets have aligned, and um, you know, it's, it's the best job in the world. Um, uh, I get tons of questions from the internet, and some of them are really hilarious. So now it's time for some funny ones. Ah, uh, blue. <laughs> one of the one of the questions that we get is uh, social purpose. What's the purpose? Like, what's the point? Um, and while that's not necessarily a funny question, I think one of the things that it does do for for people is it. People want to understand why there's even a need to start talking about business in terms of social purpose. Can you touch on this a little bit? I want to drill a little deeper. And I want to understand from uh, from your perspective, what are the what are the moments of comedy that have come out of you creating a purposeful organization? You know? Those moments when you're like, what am I doing here? Or, or and maybe they're from Toronto, or maybe they're from New York City, or maybe they're from other organizations. But, so, sorry, just to try that a bit more, so a moment of comedy, what do you mean like the... Why do you win the cookie contest every year? That's what I don't know. What do you do? Like, you're supposed to make cookies. 
which would be a disaster if they made any cookie that I made. But I didn't want to keep it in the book. Well, I'll say, um, you know, I think one, one of the challenges in the nonprofit sector, one of the purposes of the nonprofit sector is it's very earnest. Uh, it's very earnest. People are changing the world and working very hard. It's a very serious business. And I think that part of our, the success of our models is we try to introduce a little bit of levity into that. Um, you know, there's also the sense that well, we're in the nonprofit sector, so we should be, you know, working in creaky old facilities, and we should have a projector, and we should have all these things. And there's this kind of uh, association of, of, you know, more impoverished we are, the more earnest, the more moral our hard work is. And, and I, don't, I don't believe that for a second. Um, oh, I see. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I just really believe that um, the more that we can connect people's passion with purpose, the more that we have a sustainable model. You will burn out if you're not enjoying the work that you're doing. You will lose energy if it is a stultifying environment. You will. Um, End your passion. You, you know, you will you will extinguish your passion if, if you're not being rewarded in some way in terms of professional development, personal engagement, friendship, social capital, and so forth. And so, I think one of the things that we try to do in our company is to really try to create a space and a culture that celebrates the work. That you can have a beer, you can have a funny talk, you can have a funny conversation. Um, Monica was referencing the annual tradition. We say we collaborate 364 days a year, and on the 365 days, we compete in the Cookies and Cocktail Smackdown, which is the uh, official uh, official do them out, uh, do them out, them out uh, <laughs> event every holiday. Um, we don't know why. We want to go to uh, Not apparently, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> don't even know why. That's definitely, the that's the answer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, So um, a little bit of smack talk helps introduce some levity as well. It's really, it's also the fact is, is um, you know, there's a science behind it. It's not just to be silly or to be funny. It's because we know that um, project development and personal success depend part on relationships, and relationships aren't built on business transactions. Relationships are also built on um, friendships and we're not having an earthquake. We're having an earthquake, we're having a technical earthquake. No, it's good. <laughs> Guys, uh, okay. speaking of levity, still still you still have a whole camera over there. Just okay. talk to that one. Well, um, the, the, um, you cannot underestimate the importance of personal relationships and that personal connections in helping in a professional way. And if you focus just on the professional, you will build up with many very professional relationships. But if you add fun, personal contact, We've got a running club, we're doing an art gallery walk next week, we're doing our lunches. Those are things that have spirit, and those form the basis of relationships that can be leveraged in untold ways. And so it's not just a lark or a funny thing that we do to build community or create these uh, activities. It is fundamental to a larger vision of really creating social change in a way that is current, relevant, and meaningful. All right, so what's your champion <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? You have to have a question. Well, I started the running club. And, uh, and, and I started, there were probably 47 people that uh, signed up, and I'm chanting because I'm the only one still going. <laughs> running back to start. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of it every day yeah. while you're out there. So it's all 47 people. <laughs> um, well, we could do a biking club because they just started a city bike down here. But, um, yeah, so I mean, what's the cultural difference between Toronto and New York between you two? I mean, you were a big New Yorker, yeah. real New Yorker, uh, as in real name New Yorker. I think anybody that makes it beyond the six months has the curve stripes, frankly. <laughs> but what's the difference? I mean, uh, are they very polite, uh, the Canadians? I mean, this is what we heard. I think I don't really, I don't notice the difference. I mean, Eli and I have the Red, white, wing, the same, have a twisted sense of humor. Um, I really don't notice that much of a difference. I mean, Eli, as a person, is a type. Uh, he says no, always. First. 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 And then <laughs> you, you gotta chop him down. Yeah, that's but, true. 
I don't know that that's a Canadian thing or a new thing. But I really think in Nazis, I don't see that much of a... Uh, and, and by the way, I'll say that we are... Um, we work very closely, so I work a lot. I go back to Toronto. Our director team is made up of directors from here and there. And it's, there's no difference. It's an amazing city. But what, what do you think about um, I think it's, I think there are less differences than um, some people perhaps like to believe. Oh, I mean, one of the things that strikes me walking into the space here in New York City is the degree to which it is, uh, it feels the same as it feels in Toronto. It really feels like a you could almost just transplant the uh, the people or the atmosphere. It really is very, very similar. The sectors are very similar. The people are similar. They are hardworking, entrepreneurial folks that are trying to uh, make a difference. The only other kind of cultural difference I will say, I do think that um, Canadians and Torontonians are a little bit more risk averse. Um, you can go a little further, you can go further faster in New York City, you can kind of deal quicker, you can um, walk through the door uh, a little bit more boldly mm -hmm. and, and, and make something happen. I think a little bit, uh, a little bit yeah. faster. And so I think that I think that there are some differences. And those are functions of scale. Those are a function of, of culture. Um, there are two great cities. There, there, uh, there are there are there certainly uh, there's certainly some some differences. But I would say overall that there there's more similarities than there are. Actually, does one when we first started meeting with people. I mean, people uh, were meeting for speaking very, very he was, fast. He was coaching me. And I told you, I had my Eli. He got to speed it up. He got to speed it up. But he got it pretty quick. Uh, a dual hour question from me in Japan. Thank you so much for pushing me. He says, Mac or PC? First dual hour question. <laughs> um, recovering PC user, current Mac user. Uh, other dual hour question. Uh, mac and cheese, or <laughs> Philly steak? So that, I, I can answer for David, and David try to answer for me. So Dave's answer to that is neither. Uh, what's right. mine? Yeah. Mac and cheese. Yeah, I'll probably go with mac and cheese. Philly so <laughs> cheese steak is exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly both. He's neither or not both, that's exactly. But well, I want to know, like, I just want to tell you, I learned a lot about Toronto from John Stewart. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Have you heard about Mayor of Toronto right now and some of the really fun skins that John Stewart's doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's the, the line of mayor? Thing, it's the type of thing that doesn't really need much satire added <laughs> onto it for sure. So, John, this is it's basically somebody's law of the softball at, at John Stewart these days. Um, you know, um, this is a mayor that uh, was voted in by a base. Uh, of say 35 percent of the city that um, you know all strongly aligned with his values. This is the kind of guy you can have a beer with. Uh, the other 65 percent, we're still cracking. But uh, the other 65 percent of us in growing are in incredibly perplexed at what the other 35 percent are thinking, uh, and unfortunately represents a split in the city that he has wedged even further. Um, he's experiencing lots of personal misfortune, and in many ways, he and his uh, ball have brought it upon themselves. It's a terribly unfortunate situation. The good news is that the city will go on. There's lots of great people there doing great things. Uh, he's really become a sideshow. He's embarrassing himself. He's certainly embarrassing the city. Um, and, and as far as most of us are concerned, the, the sooner that that distraction can avoid the city can get back on the business of being a city, uh, the better. So it is a, a wild ride. Don't worry. We're not holding that against you. Down there, 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 to either a startup or an entrepreneur, I was trying to think about a social purpose. And so you, know, you don't have to be prophetic necessarily. It's better if you speak and you experience, you know, old English, but you can't do that. It's okay. No. <laughs> so go for it. I mean, I, I'm not going to focus it on social entrepreneurship. I'm going to focus it on entrepreneurship in general. That, um, Time and time again, I've seen people that are starting businesses around imagined pain points, uh, as opposed to really doing research and seeing if there's a real uh, need to start a business. Uh, because they're, they're talking to their families and they're telling them it's a good idea, so they're putting forth a lot of energy. 
as opposed to say a philosophical problem that needs to be solved and then start a business around it. So that's a, a, for me, another one thing that I see happening a lot of times, including myself. I mean, I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said around kind of research and around your practice. People proceed on a lot of assumptions, and uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. The way that you see the world is not necessarily the way the rest of the world sees the world. So, uh, verifying and validating those assumptions is key. Um, I think also being passionate about the impact and not the model is, is really important. Um, if you're determined, uh, don't fixate on your one model, on your one idea, on your one way of doing things. Allow that to evolve and be changed with new information, with the changing world. Focus on the impact that you're trying uh, to create and be ready to throw it out the window if there's something better or there's another way to do it. Um, the other thing I'll say is too many people I think are determined to go alone. We are uh, increasingly knitted together in a, in a larger fabric, and those that are most successful recognize how to create effective collaborations, how to be part of something that is larger than themselves, and how to move systems not incrementally but in concert with others. And so I, I say look a little deeper, look a little further upstream, focus on the impact you want to create, and, um, and, and be open, be able to really modify and change. Eli, that was the longest 30 seconds. That was not the longest. That was the longest. It could be another 30 seconds. No, but wait. I, I have a note. Amazing. I love, I love that the insight. It's fantastic. A note from the Bronx. Um, what do you see for the future here? Like, what's the big goal that you can envision it? In 30 seconds. All right, we'll start with you because you're good at a minute. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean we, we, the first six months, we were developing uh, our operations. Mm -hmm. Now we're the, Turning our attention to really focusing on enhancing vendor value, uh, really uh, bringing in unbelievable programming and making the space you know, just the best place in New York City to work for a social entrepreneur on profit. Aside from that, we have a great opportunity to connect uh, within this building our community with the amazing brands that are in the building and potentially awakening the social entrepreneur within a lot of these companies. And I'm very excited about starting that. Uh, in the new year, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity. We'll really be able to take some success and chat the light on uh, when we bring these two worlds together and that now. These are some of the biggest fashion merchandisers. Fashion, healthcare, technology, and it's, it's some mm -hmm. amazing uh, companies in this world. Mm -hmm. And just to let folks know, where, where are we? We are in the Lehigh building, uh, in Chelsea, New York City, which is right on the west side half of the border. And it, it consumes a whole world. The 10th largest building in the city is 8 miles of windows in the building. Uh, it's actually larger than the entire state building. It's gorgeous. It's really gorgeous. Eli, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I'll just say that I think the way that we've been looking at our own growth has been in these concentric circles. And the first step is, you know, to build a really, really strong team uh, and have that function well. Uh, then it's to build a community and to have that function well. And that's really the stage right now. As Dave uh, suggested, it starts then looking at the building. And then from there, it's looking at the city. What is our role in New York City? How can we galvanize, mobilize, catalyze a movement for social innovation? How do we support the great work that's already going on in the city? We've got a great position with the bird's eye view. We can act as that neutral convener. And so we think that there's a really significant opportunity for us to help, help us moving forward, not just in New York City, but around the world. And I'll also say that one of the things we've learned, being in such a dynamic space, perhaps this is other uh, advice for entrepreneurs, is to not to, um, you have to really hold the tension between being uh, uh, intentional and organic or, or emergent. Uh, we have a, a, we always try to shape about 75% of what that future vision should be, but you need to leave that other 25% open. The world's changing too quickly, there's too much more opportunity, and for us as a new organization in New York City, uh, it really feels like the, the cities are always great. What we really want to do is let the city speak to us, let the, let the world speak to us, and help us understand um, what we may accomplish. But, but certainly in times there'll be a, a, a like a loan fund, mentorship, and office hours, all sorts of different assets to help accelerate. He's laughing because, you know, Yeah, well, if you're <laughs> serious about it, it's like, yeah, if you're serious about it, I, I, I didn't get the impression that. We need a little clock. I think we just, wow, we just had to do it in between. Toronto time. 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 To
hopefully uh, next week or beginning of the week after, we'll have a little webinar where we'll get a chance to ask these guys via Twitter some questions, and they can reply back to those questions via Twitter as well. And don't worry, there's this thing called Tweet Longer, mm -hmm. so even Eli can write a tweet in more than 140 characters. Yes. Even though for 500 characters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Check them out at nyc.social information.org and that you can find out lots more about it there or check out their original home to social innovation about the club. If you want to go running you can find it on that matters. We'll put it on Facebook and, and you'll see the lone guy out there in three degree weather. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you both. That's right. awesome. Thanks. Really Ciao everyone. Uh, check us out. All right. at, uh, Facebook.com slash that matters. Have a good one. Ciao.